Jeremiah chapter 1 in your Bibles. Looking to walk through the entire first chapter of Jeremiah this evening, which is somewhat unique for the beginning of a book, as normally we start rather slow. Um, I'm not going to give you quite as much background right now. I think I'm going to hit that at a few other points along the path where we talk a little bit more. We're going to weave in and out of history a little bit as we get to various passages where we interact with some of these kings and some of the other prophets who are prophesying at this time. We also want to try to maintain a focus because Jeremiah spans these kings and spans uh, these other prophets that we don't get too distracted. So uh, we're trying to find that balance there. Today, however, we are beginning the exposition of the book of Jeremiah. And in it we learn about this man who God used to deliver the messages which we'll study over the course of the next many months. We are speaking the, the, this, uh, this evening of his call. We are considering the call of the Lord upon his life. As we discussed last week, most of what we'll learn about Jeremiah as a man will learn throughout the course of the book as he reveals himself in various emotional ways. We'll study his reactions to the prophecies which God has asked him to give. Today, we learn about Jeremiah as a minister, however. We learn about his call, the burdens which God is going to ask him to bear. And we begin in verses 1 through 3. The Bible says this, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. We're introduced to the prophet Jeremiah, who is said to be the son of Hilkiah. There are no less than eight Hilkiahs mentioned in the scriptures. We found one of them this morning, right? Uh, uh, Eliakim was the son of a Hilkiah. One notable one was the high priest. That's the one we read about this morning. Uh, um, oh, excuse me, not the one we read about this morning. That was the householder. Another notable one, excuse me, was Hilkiah the high priest. We read about him in 2 Kings 22. We were in 2 Kings 18 this morning. He served in the days of King Josiah along with Shaphan the scribe. There was also a notable Hilkiah after the captivity in the days of Nehemiah. Neither one of these is the father of Jeremiah, however. This is a different Hilkiah, one of whom we learn nothing else about other than what we find here, that he is the father of Jeremiah and that they were priests of Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. To this end, we understand Jeremiah to be a Levitical priest, that their family served the tribe of Benjamin. Anathoth was a city assigned to the Levites in Benjamin, it was about three miles northeast of Jerusalem, so right on that border there, into that region of, um, Ju of Judah and Benjamin. It was notable for being the home of Abiathar the priest, who ministered in the days of David. We read about him in 1 Kings 2.26. It was also the home of two of David's mighty men. Abiezar, according to 2 Samuel 23.27, was of Anathoth, and Jehu, <laughs> as well. So we find that they lived in this area, Anathoth. You see there, what I give you is Hebron at the bottom, Bethlehem, and then Anathoth above it, just to give you an idea of where things are found in accordance with um, the general relative positioning. We also find that the time period of Jeremiah's ministry is listed in this introduction as well. Jeremiah writes that the word of the Lord came to him at, uh, beginning in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, king of Judah. It also came in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Jehoi Josiah. It extended all the way to the 11th year of King Zedekiah, which is the final year of Judah's history, as we mentioned last week. Zedekiah's 11th year was the year of the destruction and the final captivity of the people of Judah, destruction of Jerusalem. We mentioned some of these things in our book sermon last week, but 
let's get a little bit more detailed as we understand some of these timetables. When we read of the kings of Judah and Israel during the time of what we call the divided monarchy, when the northern ten tribes of Israel were separated from the southern two tribes of Judah, we understand that for their wickedness, the northern kingdoms of Israel were sent into captivity at the hands of the Assyrian Empire in 722 BC. The final king was King Hosea. At the same time, King Ahaz ruled in Israel, and he ruled from 735 to 715 BC. When we speak of the kings of Israel and Judah, the Bible presents them in a very dualistic fashion. They're presented either as being good kings who did right in the sight of the Lord, or evil kings who did evil in the sight of the Lord. Nearly every king in the history of the northern tribes of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, nearly every king was an evil king who did evil in the sight of the Lord. The southern tribe, however, of Judah, comprised of Judah and Benjamin, is a much more of a mixed bag. Many good kings, many kings who did right in the sight of the Lord. Ahaz, however, the king that was um, ruling during the time of the final king of the northern tribes of Israel, Hosea, Ahaz was a king who did evil in the sight of the Lord. His reign soon gave way, however, to King Hezekiah, who began his reign in 715 BC, about seven years after Israel fell to the Assyrian Empire. And King Hezekiah not only did right in the sight of the Lord, but he was one of the best kings of Israel's his, of Judah, excuse me, of, of Judah's history. Then came Manasseh, who began very evil. So evil, in fact, that it was Manasseh's great evils, his great sins, and the sins that he led, led the nation of Judah into that sealed God's decision to send that nation into captivity. In the final years of his reign, he was actually taken captive, and in captivity he repented, and he was restored to the kingdom, he was restored to his rule, and he repented, and he did right in those final days, but the damage had already been done. So we read this in 2 Kings 21, verses 11 and 12 in regard to Manasseh. The Bible says in verse 11 of 2 Kings 21, because Manasseh, king of Judah, hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth of it, both his ears shall tingle. So Manasseh, the great sin, the great abominations that are spoken of prior to this is primarily that he caused the children of Israel to pass through the fire. This is the idea of the sacrificing of infant children by fire to false gods. And it was this abomination of the death of the innocent children of the land that, that caused God to say, the, sa the fate of this nation is sealed, they will be destroyed. Because he had caused Judah to go after idolatry. After that was Ammon. Ammon, excuse me. Ammon only reigned for a little over two years in Jerusalem. And that leads us to Josiah. Imagine then the foundation that Josiah had laid for him. The, the, the foundation of Manasseh and Ammon, both kings who did evil in the sight of the Lord. Manasseh ruled from 697 to 642. That's, a, that's quite a span. So for the past 50 some odd years of Jerusalem's history, the last two kings great, great evil has been done. Josiah then rules. And we find in 2 Kings 22, verses 1 and 2, this about Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedid, uh, Jedid, uh, Jedid, <laughs> Jedida. There we go. My apologies. The daughter of Adiah of Bosketh. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So Je uh, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. The total time of his reign 
was 31 years. Remember that Jeremiah began his ministry in the 13th year of King Josiah. That would be the 13th year of his reign when Josiah was 21 years of age. When one studies the life of Josiah, the significance of his reign revolves around a singular event, which led to massive reforms in the nation, which, which led to some unique things that had not been seen since the days of Solomon. And we read about these as we continue in 2 Kings 22, verses 3 through 5. The Bible says, It came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshalem, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, there's our Hilkiah, that he may sum up the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people, and let them deliver it into the hands of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house of the Lord. So Jeremiah began his ministry in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. And we find in the 18th year of Josiah, the king begins an initiative to repair the temple, which had been left in complete disrepair and under minimal use, if any. When we think of Old Testament Israel, my mind associates it so strongly with the temple that it's difficult to imagine that this grand temple that Solomon had, had built for the Lord was in any state of disrepair. But what we find as we study is that, I mean, there were holes in the walls, things had not been upkept at all. And the temple was in a tremendous place of disrepair. Josiah decides in the 18th year that he wants to change this. And so he commissions his high priest and his scribes to take the money that had been given to the temple to put it into the hands of laborers who would do the work to repair the house of the Lord. Now I'm going to read a large portion of Scripture, verses 8 through 20, to give some context here, and then we're going to talk about it. This is really fascinating. Beginning in verse 8, the Bible says this, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work and have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the, word, the words of the book of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Akbor the son of Micaiah and Shaphan the scribe and Azahiah the son of the kings saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to all that which is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam and Akbor and Shaphan and, Az Az and Azahiah went unto Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Harhaz, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college. And they communed with her and said unto them, and she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah have read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall ye say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou hear, heardest what I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord." Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace. 
and then I shall not see all the evil which I bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. This is three years before Jeremiah begins his ministry. Josiah begins at eight. In his 18th year, he reforms, he, 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 he gets the temple cleaning. In the 13th year of his reign, which is when he's 21 years old, Jeremiah begins his ministry. Are you following this with me? 18 years old, 10 years into his ministry, reforms of the temple. 21 years old, 13 years into his reign, excuse me, Jeremiah's ministry begins. Hilkiah and Shaphan were a part of this cleanup crew. They find in the temple, in the rubble and the mess and whatever else, the law. And Hilkiah says, look, I found a copy of the law. And Shaphan reads it because he's the scribe. And then he takes it to the king and says, I found this book in the temple. Josiah's like, what's that? Shaphan says, it's really interesting. He reads it to the king. The king says, I wonder if this is true. So far removed they had been from the law. None of them had ever read the law before. Shaphan the scribe had never read the law before. Maybe Hilkiah had. All he says is, I found the copy of the law. At least he knew what it was. Josiah says, is this true? This 18-year-old young man, king for 10 years, is this true? I mean, who had he known? Ammon? Manasseh? The last good king had been Hezekiah? Hezekiah had served the Lord? Josiah institutes some reforms after this. They institute the Passover, the Bible says, for the first time in generations. But he goes to hold of the prophetess. Interesting that he goes to a prophetess um, in this instance. Jeremiah had not yet been called. And he inquires of the Lord. And this prophetess says, absolutely, Jerusalem will be under judgment. But it won't take place in your days because your heart was tender before the Lord. Three years into this reform, This is when Jeremiah begins ministering. Now, we've considered all of this to understand the days in which Jeremiah ministered. The 13th year of the reign of Josiah, when Josiah is 21 years old, Jeremiah begins his ministry. Three years ago, Josiah had said, let's get the temple clean. We don't know how long it had actually been that they were cleaning before they found the law and they read the law and these sorts of things. Most likely by this point, reforms had begun to be instituted to some degree, some way, shape, or form. We get back into the text, and we read in verses 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. We read here of Jeremiah's call in the 13th year of Josiah. The word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah and told him that he had been chosen, foreordained to be a prophet unto the nations, set apart for a very particular purpose. We've spoken on several occasions before of the importance of understanding the biblical distinctions as it relates to foreknowledge, foreordination, and election. I'm not going to preach uh, thoroughly on it. I preached a message on election not too long ago on a Sunday evening. And we are not going to uh, rehash that. I'm not going to preach another uh, message. I do not intend to as of right now on foreordination, um, predestination, foreknowledge, election, and such, unless the Lord really changes my mind this week on that. But what we emphasize when we, under, when, when we see the concepts of foreordination and foreknowledge is this, that God is a God who is beyond time. As such, God is a God who knows what will happen before it happens, implicitly, right? He has to know what happens before it happens because God is outside of time. God knows eternity future as he knows eternity past. Jesus Christ is said in Revelation to have been the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, right? 
the idea that the lamb had to be slain was foreordained, was understood, was foreknown before the foundations of the world were even laid. Because God is beyond time. God knows. God created time and he knows what it comprises. He knows the choices that we will make. He knows the circumstances that would lead a man to make certain choices if indeed those circumstances existed. To this end, before God had even formed Jeremiah in the womb, a good reminder that it is God who creates life, by the way, God who forms us, that God has intent in the womb for us. We're not a mistake. But before that had even taken place, God knew the direction that Jeremiah would take. God knew the decisions Jeremiah would make. God knew Jeremiah's temperament, his propensities. God knew Jeremiah, his, uh, he knew the extent of his faith. He knew that he would be usable. And so he had foreordained Jeremiah, knowing the path that Jeremiah would be on before he was even born, that he would become a prophet to the nations. Nothing in this text, however, or any other passage having to do with foreknowledge and foreordination, predestination or the like, ever says that God made Jeremiah be a man of faith. Ever says that God caused Jeremiah to have the faith that he had in the sense of that God created the faith in him. Or that, that God made Jeremiah get saved. Or that God had chosen Jeremiah to be saved. Or any of those things. None of that is in the Bible. None of that is here. What is here is this. God knew Jeremiah from the beginning. God knew the path that Jeremiah would be on. And God knew that at the time in history where they were, in the place where they were, for the needs that God had, that Jeremiah's faith, Jeremiah's temperament, Jeremiah's age, that everything about Jeremiah would be right for the time and the place where God needed him. And so God looking at cross history and seeing a time when a man like Jeremiah was needed and seeing a man live out his life like Jeremiah had, have faith like Jeremiah had, have a temperament like Jeremiah had, and God saw the intersection of a moment in history with a man. And God said, that's going to be my man for that time and that place. And God said, I'm choosing him in eternity past for the ministry. Not because God didn't choose Jeremiah to be saved, God didn't choose Jeremiah to make the choices he did. Jeremiah had a will. Jeremiah exercised that will. And Jeremiah's will brought him to the intersection of his will and God's will. And God knew that. And so God chose him for that place and that time. This is what God is telling Jeremiah here. That Jeremiah has been chosen, elect for a ministry. And Jeremiah's choices have brought him to a place where he was qualified for that. And now Jeremiah was going to accept it or not accept it. And God knew the choice he would make, which is why God brought it to him. No way does this passage imply that Jeremiah had no choice in the matter. It simply means that God, knowing who Jeremiah would be, knowing the faith of Jeremiah and the time in which he lived, had in foreknowledge selected Jeremiah to this particular ministry to be a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah is not necessarily on board with this in initially. Many a minister is reluctant. We find in verse 6, Jeremiah responds to God's call. Imagine God coming and saying, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you and I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah says, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a child. Jeremiah reacts in what I would call the most natural way possible. He says, Lord, I, I'm a child. Before we explain this, let me just mention one of the uniquenesses of our King James Bible as it's highlighted here. We've mentioned before that anytime you find capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your King James Bible, that is a designation for Jehovah or Yahweh, right? The covenant name of God with his people. Every time it comes up, it's all caps Lord. Notice in this passage, the all caps is God, not Lord. But it's still the name Jehovah. It's still the covenant name of God. What has happened here 
is that the given name of God here is Adonai Jehovah. Adonai is the word Lord, like master. Like Sarah called her husband master, Adonai, Lord. The idea that someone has authority over you. That's that word here, Adonai. So we have Adonai Jehovah. Well, Jehovah is normally designated with capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Lord. And Adonai is normally designated with capital L, lowercase o-r-d. But it would be really strange for Jeremiah to be crying out, Lord, Lord, lowercase, uppercase, right? It doesn't read well. So what the King James translators have done is in places where Lord, Adonai, precedes Jehovah, Lord, they ch change Jehovah to God in all caps. So it's still in all caps, so we know it's Jehovah, but it, des it, it distinguishes itself from Lord, Adonai, which is not in all caps. So that's something that you see here. Anytime you see his name in all caps, that's what we're looking at, Jehovah. Jeremiah's response is that he cannot speak. I cannot be the one to speak to the nations. I cannot be the one to, to cry out. I cannot be the prophet. I cannot be your spokesperson because I'm young. I'm a child. The Hebrew word there, a boy, a lad, a young man. No one knows exactly how old Jeremiah is when his ministry begins. But he served for well over 40 years, pushing 50 years in his service. Many estimate, therefore, his age to have been perhaps between 20 and 25 when he began, certainly well before Ezekiel's ministry, which began at 30. And it's upon these grounds that Jeremiah objects. He may even be younger still. We don't know. But Jeremiah objects by saying, God, I'm too young to speak for you. God responds in verses 7 and 8. The Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. God mildly rebukes Jeremiah here in the same way he mildly rebuked Moses when Moses said he could not speak. He mildly rebukes Jeremiah, telling him not to worry about his youth, certainly not to use it as an excuse. His youth was no matter because all he was asking, all he was being asked to do was to tell others what God told him, was to say, thus saith the Lord. The ministry of the prophet was not by any means easy, but it was in fact quite simple. The ministry of the prophet was this. God tells you to say a certain thing to a certain people group. You go to that people group and you say that certain thing. God then exhorts Jeremiah and don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of how the people will respond. Don't be afraid of whether or not the people will listen. Don't be afraid of how they might treat you because God will be with you. God will deliver you. God will protect you. Finally, within our passage, uh, well, not finally, as we continue through our passage today, we've got a lot left to do. As we continue through our passage today, we find God setting the mouth of Jeremiah apart. Verses 9 and 10, the Bible says this, Then the Lord put his hand, put forth his hand, and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Within this vision, the Bible says, God puts out his hand and touches the mouth of Jeremiah. By this indicating that Jeremiah was a man chosen through whom God would speak, as God says here that he is putting his words in Jeremiah's mouth, that Jeremiah will speak the words of God to the nations. There are many who claim to speak in the name of God. There were only a select few who God actually had proclaimed, who, had, who God had actually ordained to proclaim his words. This is not necessarily an unusual circumstance as far as prophets go. We see a similar account of Isaiah. We've already spoken of Isaiah 6 a couple of times, both this morning and this evening. Uh, this is Isaiah's vision of the Lord, of the seraphim around the, the throne, this, the crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, we read this. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. 
and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and then I, thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin purged. In Isaiah's case, we find that there's a coal from off the altar, which the Bible says burns perpetually in front of the throne of God. And a coal was taken off that altar and touched his lips, saying that his lips have been sanctified, that they have been set apart for the Lord's purposes, that his lips will speak the words of the Lord, that he was commissioned to say the words of the Lord. Ezekiel also had a similar experience. His is a little bit more burdensome, however. The Bible tells us this in Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. The Lord says, And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb and shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear. He that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. In Ezekiel's case, the, God goes one step further. In a vision, God takes a coal from off the altar and touches uh, Isaiah's lips. In a vision, God touches the mouth of Jeremiah and says, I have put my words in your mouth. God says to Ezekiel, I am going to not allow you to speak. I am going to make your tongue cleave to the roof of your mouth. You are not going to be allowed to speak except when I am speaking through you. Ezekiel's mouth would not be opened again for him to speak at his own discretion for another seven years and two months. For seven years and two months, the only time he could open his mouth and utter words was when God was speaking through him. It's quite a burden to bear. Jeremiah is called in like fashion tells Jeremiah that he has been set over nations and kingdoms. The prophets were not under the authority of kings. The prophets were not under the authority of nations. The prophets spoke the word of the Lord to nations and to kings. The prophet looked at the king and said, thus saith the Lord. The prophet called out to the nations and said, thus saith the Lord. The prophet was given authority to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build and to plant. The idea behind this is that Jeremiah is a proxy for the authority of God. And so his authority, by, by proxy of God's authority, transcended nations and kingdoms. His words would become words of iron. That if he said it, it was to be, thus saith the Lord. It was to be settled. A great privilege. Even a greater responsibility. Which is likely why Jeremiah's first words were, Lord God, I cannot speak, I am a child. We continue, verses 11 through 16. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came unto me in the second time, saying, what seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north, and evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me and to burn incense unto other gods and worship the works of their own hands. So the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah again. And God in this instance shows Jeremiah a couple of visions. The first vision that Jeremiah sees is the vision of an almond tree. Almond trees are characteristically unique as it relates to the holy lands. And the, the unique characteristic of the almond tree is that they bloomed very, very early in the spring. As a matter of fact, before the spring, the almond tree would wake up from its hibernation generally in January, and it would begin bearing fruit in March, significantly earlier than the other trees. By this then, God says, what do you see, Jeremiah? Jeremiah says, I see an almond tree. The proclamation of the word of the Lord is, I will hasten my word to perform it. The idea of the symbol of the almond tree is that God is telling his people that these judgments are coming quickly. That he is hastening the word of the Lord. That there's going to be a early blossoming of the Lord's judgments. The second picture 
Jeremiah sees a seething pot that's facing toward the north. The pot is in the north, ready to pour out its content southward is the idea here. A seething pot was a pot meant to be placed close to a fire that would cause it to maintain a boil so that you could boil meat and you could boil foods. It was in the north. It was ready to pour out southward by this declaring that God's judgment would come from the people of the north. And when it did come, it would be like boiling, scalding water. It would overcome the city. It would destroy it. And in verse 16, God gives his reasons. He says, touching all their wickedness, excuse me, who have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. Idolatry. The same thing that we saw in the days of Manasseh. God is just and God is going to chasten his people. God then tends, uh, turns his message directly to Jeremiah and the job that God has given to him as we finish out the text here. Verses 17 through 19. It says 11 through 16 above. I'm sorry. It's verses 17 through 19. The text says this. Thou therefore gird up thy loins, speaking to Jeremiah, and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. So God exhorts Jeremiah finally to prepare himself, to prepare himself mentally and to prepare himself spiritually for the battle that is about to rage. He tells Jeremiah that if he sinks back in fear, that Jeremiah will be broken, that he will be confounded before the people, that he will, he will be broken by them and their rejections. But God says if he strengthens himself in the Lord, then the Lord will make him unbreakable. Then the word of the Lord through him will be unbreakable, that he will be unmovable, that the Lord will protect him, that the Lord will make him a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen walls. All pictures speaking of those things which are strong and impenetrable, fortified. God promises Jeremiah two things. He promises him, they're going to resist you. And he also promises and I will protect you. These are the terms of the call. God says, I've called you. I've known you before I formed you. I knew you. I've called you for this ministry. Jeremiah says, I cannot speak. God says, you'll just speak my words. You'll go and you'll tell my words. I will give you authority over nations and kingdoms. You'll go speak my words. That's all you have to do. And this is what Jeremiah needed to know. It was coming quickly. And it was coming surely from the north. And God says, they're going to resist you, but I will fortify you. If you fail, though, if you cower, if you lose courage, if you shrink back, you'll be confounded before them. They'll break you. He says, but they won't if you stick to the plan because I'm with you. I'll be with you. I will not leave you. That's the call of Jeremiah. Several applications this morning in our text. Point number one, as we come to our applications, God has known you from before you were formed. Point number one, God has known you from before you were formed. We're reminded this evening that God knows you. We're reminded that he's known you since before you were formed. In Jeremiah's case, this message was given to him as confidence in the call of God. A confidence Jeremiah needed because of his youth, because of the ministry of suffering which he, unto which he was ordained. But let this be a reminder to us in every context. Believer, you are not a mistake. How God made you is not a mistake. You are not an accident. You have been formed by God. There's been an epidemic in the last couple of weeks of suicides, if you've read the news. Several notable, well-known people have committed suicide over the last couple of weeks. 
One, uh, a well-known designer, one uh, person that works at CNN, um, so a couple of others, a well-known chef. And so there's been a conversation in secular uh, circles of late about suicide and, of course, suicide prevention hotline and people trying to figure out what suicide is about. We live in a society that lacks purpose. We live in a society where people are, be, are, are having to be validated by their feelings or validated by the identity they've propped up for themselves. And this is a dangerous thing, but it's not uncommon in humanity that we would see ourselves as purposeless, that we would see our failings, that we would see our, our, um, our imperfections, our impurities, our flaws, and we would feel as though somehow that we are a mistake, that the things that we have are a mistake, that, that the fact that we're not smart or, or, or the way that we look or, or our, our abilities or our inabilities or our temperament uh, are, are a mistake. Why am I not this way? Why am I not that way? Why can't I be this? Why can't I be that? Why can't I have this? Why can't I have that? What's wrong? It's a mistake. I'm a mistake. You're not a mistake. You're not a mistake. God knew you from before he formed you. There are unchangeables in our lives. Things that exist in us by nature. Parts that are not developed by you. Parts that are just who you are. Your looks are general unchangeables. Jesus said we cannot make one hair white or black. Well, sure I can. I can dye it. Yes, but it's not making, it's not actually changing anything, right? As soon as your hair grows, it's going to grow back the color that it was. Elements of your personality are unchangeable. Whether or not you have tenacity or not, you can work something into you, but it doesn't make it natural, right? There are naturally tenacious people and naturally not tenacious people. I can work into myself something that's not there, and I, I can do that, but it doesn't make it natural. There are natural introverts and extroverts. An introvert can work through those things, but it's never going to work out the natural propensity that is in him. Does not mean you cannot grow and conquer, but propensities still exist and must be accounted for. And that can lead to frustration. God, why couldn't I just have been I have to fight through this. I have to work through this. I have to, be, try, I have to try to work through uh, my, my lack of tenacity. I have to work through my, my introvert nature. I have to work through these things. I have to, to, to uh, go out of my way. I, it's so easy for him. It's so easy for her to be motivated. It's so easy to just go up and talk to people. God, why did you do this? I'm a mistake. You're not a mistake. You're not a mistake. Many of us, especially our young people, as they grow and learn about themselves, will find yourselves unsatisfied with some element of who you are. Element of how God made you. You're reminded today, just in this brief, tendential way, that God knew you before you were formed. That you are not a mistake. And we read of a similar concept in Psalm 139. I've taken you there before for this point. The psalmist writes in verses 14 through 16, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect and in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Your unchangeables are not a mistake. God formed you. He gave you what he chose to give you. For some of us, this is not a comforting thought, but rather leads us to say, well, then why did God make me this way? And this is why verse 14 is so important. Because regardless of the unchangeables that you have, you need to remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That the Lord's marvelous works are seen in you. God did not make a mistake. You are not a curse. And you are not accursed. 
The way God made you can be used by God to serve him to the fullest of his desire for you, whether great or small. And let us remember this. One more important thing about this. Recognizing God's sovereignty over our unchangeables should not be an excuse for us to know to ignore the changeables. In other words, recognizing that I'm, I am a certain way, that I have certain propensities, is not an excuse for me to not try. Well, God, I'm an introvert, so I'm not going to share the gospel. No, it doesn't work that way. Maybe you're gifted in different ways to evangelize. But God did not give his great commission only to introverts or extroverts. Well, I don't have tenacity. I don't, I don't have, I don't have uh, initiative. So, so I just really struggle with initiative. So I'm not going to volunteer for anything because it's going to be hard to get going. No, no, it's not like that. Just means you're going to have to submit yourself to the Lord. Just means you're going to have to allow him to help you overcome to do the things that he's called you to do. Jeremiah had to do that, didn't he? Lord, I'm, I'm just a child. Now that's solved in time, right? But the fact of the matter is he felt ill-equipped for the ministry that God had called him to. And really, that's not uncommon among ministers, is it? That we are ill-equipped for the ministry that God has called us unto. Why does God call those who are ill-equipped for the ministry? So that God can do the work through them, right? If God calls a young man who hates speaking, who hates public speaking, who could not do it, who is never comfortable with it, to become a pastor of a church and to become a preacher of the gospel, God did it for one reason and one reason only. So that at the end of the day, the people that saw Pastor Wickler grow up could not say, wow, I saw that coming. Wow, he has a real gift in that area. He went into the right, right, right area. Instead, they can say, wow, that's unusual. He was always really quiet, didn't want to talk to anyone, felt really uncomfortable around people, did not want to public speak in any form, fashion, or, or context. Now look at him. That's God. And God can be glorified in us. This is not unusual. When we submit our weaknesses to the Lord, when we submit those things to the Lord, that we might think are a mistake, that we might think are a problem, and God says, now I've got you right where I want you, now I can use you, because I can be great through you, because I can be strong through you, because I can be, I can, my, because now my power can be realized in you, in a new and a living way. Likewise, I cannot excuse my sin because of the unchangeables. We all have sinful tendencies in our lives, don't we? Certain people are born with a propensity to anger. Others are not. Some people are born with a propensity toward um, lust. Others are not. Some with a propensity towards intemperance. Others are not. Some are born naturally rebellious or stubborn, others are just go with the flow. And with whatever sinful propensities and tendencies you have, now those were not given to you by God, per se, those are often sins of the fathers, these sorts of things. But to whatever degree you have these, you cannot excuse your sin because of your propensities. These are simply ways that God will have to elevate his power in you. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we are not taking things that are entirely changeable and calling them unchangeables and then not working on them. We need to be careful that we're not allowing our propensities sinful, sinfully to become excuses for sinning. And we need to be careful that we don't allow our unchangeables to become either resentment toward God or to become discouragement as to how God made us. Point number two, whom God sends, he enables, equips, and defends. I often express this thought this way, where God leads, God provides. 
There may be many reasons why you and I may not be serving God in a certain capacity, but let it never be said of any of us that we refuse the Lord because we feel inadequate. The fact of the matter is, every single man or woman on earth is inadequate to do the work of God, aren't we? Because the work of God is not carnal, it's spiritual. The work of God is a spiritual work that operates beyond the power of man. And that's a good thing. Because that means that God gets the glory for anything that's done because God has done the work. And this gives us confidence that if God so wills us to do something, if God tells us to do something, if God tells us to go somewhere, even if I don't see it, even if I'm not comfortable, even if I don't understand it, this is what we know, that when we get to where God wants us to go, when we do what God has asked us to do, His provision will be there waiting for us. His provision was, will be sent ahead. There were times, there are still times, where if a person's making a long distance move, they will send all of their stuff ahead. They even have moving companies now that'll kind of not, not just pack it all up, but they'll even unpack it all and get it all in the house, right? So that when you get to the place that you're going, your stuff is already in your house. Your stuff is already prepared for you. And you know that when you get to the destination, what will be waiting for you is all the provision that you need to start life. God calls you and he calls you to go somewhere. He sends you to a mission field. He sends you to a place that you uh, were not, are not familiar with. He sends you to a different part of the country. Or, or, or he sends you to your neighbor's door. And one way or another, it's, Lord, I'm not ready for this. I don't have what it takes. But God is saying, go do it. Go talk to that person. Go give that person a tract. Go explain the gospel to that person. Well, God, I'm not ready. God, I don't know what to say. Here is what you know where God leads his provision is waiting for you. See, because it's not about you. Ministry is not about you. Ministry is not about Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo. Legacy Baptist Church is a conduit through which ministry happens. You are a conduit through which ministry happens. We are a vessel through whom the Spirit of God can work. Our families are vessels through whom the Spirit of God can work. You are a vessel through whom the Spirit of God can work. It's not about you. Now, that doesn't mean you don't prepare. That doesn't mean you don't study to show yourself approved. What I'm saying is this. When push comes to shove, it is not about how charismatic you are. It is not about how smart you are. It is not about these things. It is about the Spirit of God in you, doing the work that God has called you to do. If God calls you to a place of service, God's provision is there. Maybe that provision will have to be built or grown, but it's there. If God calls you to a ministry opportunity for which you feel ill-equipped, know that God has provision and power for you for that ministry if you'll step out and you'll do it. God never leads where he does not equip. As Paul considered his own ministry, he said this in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 through 7, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined it in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. He speaks here of his own person, that he is weak, frail, a propensity toward fear and toward sin. The treasure is what? The treasure is the capacity, the opportunity to give the gospel, to shine the light, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the treasure that we all have. And Paul says, we contain this treasure, however, in an earthen vessel. Frail. Breakable. But that's okay. Because what it means is that when the gospel comes out of my mouth and someone receives it, there's no doubt where the power came from. Because it's not the earthen vessel that has any of the, the value. It's the treasure that's contained within the earthen vessel. It's the excellency of the knowledge of the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Excellency of the knowledge of the glory of God. 
because none of us is in ourselves capable of doing anything for the Lord. We are, as we sing, channels only. Vessels through whom God is able to work as we yield ourselves to him. So then let us not be reluctant to serve God. Let us not be reluctant to say yes when God calls. Maybe that calling is only the beginning of the journey. We saw it with Paul. We've seen it with many a minister. God calls. You say, I'm not equipped. God says, just answer the call. I say, yes, sir. I answer the call. And then God puts me on a journey to equip me for the ministry, right? It happens. But let us not refuse the calling of God because we don't see the provision. Let us not shrink back in fear at the prospect of serving the Lord in any capacity because here's the thing. Ministry is absolutely not about you. The power is not of you. The provision is not from you. The results have nothing to do with you that God may be glorified in all things. Third reminder. Youth is no hindrance to God's capacity to use you. Never in the Bible have we seen youth as a hindrance to God's capacity to use a man. We don't know all of the ages of the youth in the Bible. Oftentimes from our flannel graph days, perhaps, we see everyone is like 12 years old, right? David was 12 years old. Hannah and I, Azra and Mishael were 12 years old. Everyone's 12 years old in those flannel graphs. They're either, they're either you know, old men with beards, they're all 12. Uh, we don't know. But David was a young man when he slew Goliath, wasn't he? Whatever that means, he was a young man. Daniel, Azariah, Hananiah, Mishael, when they were taken to Babylon, they were young men, which, by the way, was during the time of Jeremiah. They were young men. It was within this vein that Paul wrote to Timothy. We don't know exactly how young Timothy is in the New Testament. But in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, we know the verse. Paul says to Timothy, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Titus chapter 2 says that the young men should be examples of purity and of faith. Young people, it is well understood that different seasons of life call for different priorities and ask different things of you. You're under the authority, young people, of your parents. To that end, your opportunities are limited to their guidance, their expectations, and their regulations for you. And this is not only okay, but this is God's design. This is right and this is good. But that's actually a part of the process of God leading. Your parents and the authority that they have over you, that's a part of the process of God leading you into ministry opportunities. That's a part of the process of God directing you toward his will. And when God directs you into his will, with your parents as a part of that process, let no man despise thy youth. Don't feel as though there's, some, there, there's no way that God can use you because of your age. There's a danger in your thinking, I can't do blank for God, I'm too young. I can't share the gospel, I'm too young. I can't serve the church, I'm too young. Let's leave that to the adults. Well, this is a faulty perspective. This is an absolutely faulty perspective. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, young person, you have the same spirit within you that I have in me. Now, your minds are not as developed as adults, right? You might not be able to put together a 45-minute sermon with points and organization and such. That's something that, that takes a while for the mind to be able to develop so that you can communicate things in a way that, that, that is clear and, and um, understandable and organized. There are things that only time and practice and experience can develop. You're not going to get up behind the pulpit and, and put together sermons like this first time, young ages. But that doesn't mean God can't use you to communicate his word. You don't have the funds to dramatically bless a missionary. But that doesn't mean God can't use you to bless missionaries in other tangible ways. We started a card ministry which we're trying to get off the ground, whereby our young people will begin to write cards to missionaries. 
seeking to encourage them in the Lord, seeking to bless them in a manner in which you can do. Why? Because you can. You can. You can pray and open your Bible and get verses that bless you and put them down on a piece of paper to bless, another, to, to bless someone else. You can go up to someone on any given day and ask them what you can be praying for for them and then get down on your knees and pray for them. You can step into the church and you can find a place to serve. The point is, youth may come with some natural limitations, but it in no way limits the capacity of God to work through you. In no way. God told Jeremiah, to whom much is given, oh, excuse me, God told Jeremiah that he had placed the prophet above the nations and the kings to set up and pull down. And that leads us to our fourth point, which is this, to whom much is given, much is required. Jeremiah was given a tremendous amount of authority and it came with a tremendous amount of accountability. God told Jeremiah, do not be afraid of their faces for if they are for if he does, then, then he will be confounded before them. When we talk about ministry opportunities, we, there's always a place to serve. But with the greater responsibilities within the ministry context, there comes greater accountability. And we need to remember this. Let us not be too hasty to seek the privileges that come with the responsibilities of ministry. Let us always be careful to count the cost, knowing that to whatever degree God blesses you, beginning with the knowledge of Christ into salvation and continuing with various abilities and capacities and knowledge as a believer, God holds you accountable for that. Once you've learned it, you're accountable to the Lord for it. If God has called you to lead others, you're accountable for them. I am accountable, not just for myself, but I am accountable as a spiritual leader for my wife, as a spiritual leader for my children. I will stand before God and I will answer for how I led them. Fathers, we all are held accountable in that way. And then I get more. I'm the pastor of Legacy Baptist Church, which means I'm accountable for what I say to you. I'm accountable for how I lead you. And I will stand before God one day and I will answer for that. And to, with each level of responsibility that the Lord gives us in ministry comes a level of accountability as well, which should give us reason to fear. With each level of blessing and ability comes expectation that you will use it for Him. But here's the thing. God did not form you for yourself. He formed you for himself. God did not save you for yourself. God saved you for him. God did not call me to be a pastor for myself. God called me to be a minister for him. And with each call, with each layer of privilege, with each layer of responsibility comes accountability. And what this means is that we need to have a ready mind. We need to step into these responsibilities with gravity, with sobriety. We need to take it seriously. We need to take this Christian life seriously because it is serious. We need to take the ministries that God has given to us seriously because we're affecting the lives of men and women. Jeremiah was a young man formed by the Lord, chosen by the Lord, enabled by the Lord, given great authority by the Lord, defended by the Lord. This is the man whom we will study over these next several months. And it will be God's words at his mouth which will weigh upon our hearts over these next many months. But for today, let us take these lessons of his call to heart. Let us remember that God formed you. He knew you before he formed you. He did not make mistakes. Let us remember that as God calls you, that when he calls you, where he sends, he equips. That where he sends, he enables. That where he sends, he defends. Young people, may I just exhort you to begin the mindset of ministry early. Don't waste 
your years saying, I'll get to that when I'm an adult. Boy, do we have that mindset today, don't we? It's been baked into this culture. The years of, of learning and then, oh, I can't wait to graduate so I can stop learning when I'm an adult. When does an adult stop learning? Oh, I can't wait to get out of this so I can stop doing that when I'm an adult. Why don't we forge in our young years lifelong habits? Why don't we forge in our young years expectations? Young people, why don't you begin forging now in your heart and in your mind ways that you can serve the Lord? Maybe it's small. That's okay. How are you serving the Lord? What are you doing for Him? The little things, the big things. Are you ministering? Are you reaching out? Are you making a difference? Let's formulate in our minds the habits that will then make us adults who are sober and who are grave and who are equipped to every good work. But let us remember as well that as we seek and ask the Lord for ministry opportunities, Jeremiah wasn't seeking, the Lord gave this to him. The Lord does that. Of course, we have to consent, we have to eventually submit. But let us always recall that as the Lord calls, as we respond, as we find ministries, let us remember that it comes with responsibility. That to whom much is given, much is required. And let us be ready to submit ourselves to the Lord in these ways in order that we might be used of him in every way.